This is the uh, recordproduction.com interview with Ken Allardyce, and here we are at Psalm Hook in Manor. Ken, nice to have you with us. Nice to be with you, George. Um, first of all, I'd like to know a little bit of ba background about yourself. So, um, and I understand you live in the States and have done for some time. How did that come about? What did, why did you go there? Um, well, I, I went out to the States originally with Supertramp as their lighting guy. Well, one of their lighting guys. And um, never really came back, is the short answer. Um, we sort of wound up in Los Angeles, the band kind of emigrated, you might say, and um, I think the weather got my got under my skin, and uh, then it sort of became home, and uh, has been for the last 28 years, so, although obviously I frequently visit back now. Mm. So how did you get to be an engineer? Well, um, I was living in Los Angeles, and um, Roger Hodgson and I both had children about the same time and decided we wanted to sort of not raise them in, in the city. It was a pretty smoggy place in those days. Mm -hmm. So we moved to Northern California, and uh, he built a studio, and basically I was sort of working with him, and when, when we were just demoing and stuff, I just sort of figured out how to make it work, just through being around it, I suppose, it loosely with the band and everything. I would not say I was a trained engineer at all at that point, but... Um, I, I started um, just sort of helping him with demos and stuff, and um, and doing my own because I, I mean I was kind of writing a bit and stuff like that at the time. And um, then when we'd make a real record, which we did a couple of his solo albums, we'd get in a real engineer. Mm. And uh, one of them was actually Jack Puig, who you probably mm -hmm. know about. And Jack sort of he he recognised that I could hear fairly well. And and um, said, why don't you make records? And I I never actually considered it. I'm a bit of a late starter in certain areas. Anyway, Jack said, listen, if you ever want to do this, and I really think you should, because I think you have the wherewithal, um, give me a call. I'll try and help you. And he did. And later, as the, the a few years later on, um, I called him. I I actually it's, it's a strange story. I don't know if you want this in full because it's it's quite an interesting little thing that happened in my life is that um, subsequent to that, my relationship with Roger kind of finished, terminated. We, were, we'd sort of, we thought we could bypass the music industry by going up to Northern California and do it on our terms. In fact, it bypassed us and yeah. we sort of left high and dry for a while. And so consequently, I decided um, I needed to do something else, and Jack had made this offer. Suddenly I got five people locally asking me to make tapes in, a, in the space of a week after nobody in my life had ever asked me to, to make a tape. And so I, I thought, well, maybe the writing is on the wall here. And I did a couple of projects locally and decided I, I really enjoyed it. So at that point, I called Jack and said, OK, I'll, if you hear of anything, I'm, I am interested. I, I think you're right. I, I think this is probably a direction for me. And um, I decided to move down to L.A. and start looking for stuff myself. The day I moved down, I got a call from him saying, OK, something's come up. It's Bill Schnee needs a guy. And uh, I told him, you're it. <laughs> and so I called Bill, and he offered me a job, which was pretty good. He was taking a chance, but I think on Jack's recommendation. And so I worked for Schnee for a couple of years, about a year and a half. The bit I omitted to tell you, which is kind of interesting, is when I had decided to become an engineer, I kind of put out in the ether the two places I want to work is first I want to work for Bill Schnee because I thought he was the best I knew of. Mm. And secondly, I want to work for Oceanway because I thought that was the best studio. And anyway, so the Schnee thing happened. And I'd been working there about a year and a half when Alan Sides walked into Schnee's to do a session. We got talking within 10 minutes. He turned around to me and said, when you're ready to come and work for me, give me a call. So it was kind of, I felt it was sort of fated in my life. So amazing. yeah, it really was amazing actually. So I went to work for Alan after, you know, maybe two years with Bill. And then I was on staff at Oceanway for about two and a half years. And from there I went independent. So that's it in a nutshell. That's Brilliant. Came Fantastic. Back. That's just, just good. That's really good. Um, so, uh, so what do you think made you good? How did you, how did you get to be so well loved? Well, that's assuming I am. <laughs> well, let's, on that assumption. Um, I don't know, I think my first love has always been music, and I come from a totally a musical place as opposed to a, a sort of technical place, and uh, I think I always assumed that making records was, you had to be very sort of scientific or, you know, understand all of the sort of 
scientific end of equipment and all of that, which I really can't claim to. And I think that probably intimidated me and I didn't think it was an area I could go to. Until over, over time I realized that it was really just a sort of in, instinctual thing, instinctive thing where it really is just the way you want to hear music. You make it sound like that. And I started doing that and got a good response from people I was working with or people listening to it. And I realized that that's really the key. And so I think the confidence came with that understanding, mm. you know. So do you produce as well as engineer? Yeah, I'm starting to get into it more and more. In fact, that's what I'm here doing at the moment, you know. And I don't know if you're interested in the, uh, hearing about that one. It's, um, yeah, it's a band called the, well, it's the Yardbirds, who you probably remember from way back. Mm. Recently they got a, they got a deal with um, a, a label called Favour Nations, which is run by Steve Vai. Mm -hmm. The project is really sort of two-sided in that half the record is using old material, old Yardbirds material, which we know and love, mm -hmm. and getting guest guitarists, mm -hmm. largely, to come and um, guest on it. And the other half is like new material, which the band uh, um, have come up with because they're now a sort of working band again. Yeah. So it's it's quite interesting, and uh, you know some of the players we've got are, are, are pretty interesting um, people influenced by the Yardbirds and uh, fans really, and again yeah. donating their time as a sort of labour of love. And we've got people such as Brian May and Slash and Steve Lukather, uh, a few more. List goes on. And in fact, uh, Jeff Beck's contributed to one of the new songs, so it's it's Fantastic. nicely rounded. Yeah. yeah, that's really good. Yeah. So you, you're known for doing a lot of kind of guitar band stuff in, in the last few years. Yeah. How, yeah. How do you go about recording guitars? Do you have any particular approaches to recording electric guitars? Um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't always, don't very often do the set the same thing exactly twice. I suppose generally. I would I would say there is usually an SM57 in my equation when I when I start. Um, sometimes two. Um, sometimes I I'll do a little thing where I'm putting them at 90 degrees to each other, which seems to have been working pretty nicely. Pretty much aimed at the center of the cone on a, on a speaker, and then usually I'll um, use another mic or two other mics as well and. Generally what I try to do is sort of build up the sound without EQ, but more with just mic placement and strategically placed mics dotted around, you know. Mm. Um, this is talking close mics at this point. Okay. And uh, the, the sort of secondary mic, or generally I'll use the 57s to get the sort of edge sound, in the sort of bite, and then fill it out uh, with something else, such as anything really, um, an 87. Uh, a tube mic even, maybe back a little bit, mm -hmm. um, a FET, 47 FET, whatever, um, all sorts of, I'll try different things really, depending on the mood and what's available kind of thing, what just yeah. feels good on the day. But it's generally the sound, I will get my sound by this combination and a blending of the, of the, of the two mics mm -hmm. and minimal EQ. I mean, I find you can get a sort of more natural sound without EQ and like mad, you know, and without not a whole lot of compression. I'll usually run it through a compressor as well, and that again can vary. Uh, 160, 1176, distressor, anything, anything, whatever's around. Tube tech. <laughs> it's uh, there's no hard and fast rules. Really, depending on the mood and just, I suppose again, it's when you hear the sound, you hear the sound coming out of the box, and then you decide, sort of instinctively, what you want to use. You I mean, do that first, then you go and have a listen to the guy. Yeah, well, a uh, little trick I was taught by a friend of yours, Al Schmidt. <laughs> when I first started uh, assisting in LA, I had the benefit of working with a lot of these old guys who had been, um, you know, great, who are great, and Al being one of them, who became a good bud and taught me a lot. And two tips he, he gave me when I first started, which seem incredibly simple, but are in fact great advice, the first was make friends with the musician. Make him your friend. Get him eating out of your hand, and then half your job's done, which I'm sure is you know. I mean, if you're fighting with a musician, you're not, it's going to be a hard day, you know? But if they're working with you, it makes it so much easier. And it seems obvious, but, it was, but it's true. And the other one he told me was go out into the room and listen to your instrument. 
before you try to record it. And I, that actually seemed obvious to me, but he said, I said, well, wouldn't you do that anyway? And he goes, yeah, but you watch how many engineers don't do that. He says, most of them come straight into the control room, put their heads down over the board and start twiddling knobs like crazy. And he says, well, that's sort of a bit absurd if you think about it. And it is really, isn't it? So yeah, absolutely. Go out, listen to what it sounds like. If you're trying to create a sound out of the speakers, out of nowhere, okay, that's, that's a different thing. But if you're trying to reproduce an instrument, you might as well hear what it sounds like before you try to reproduce it. And so, yeah, and that's kind of my rule of thumb. Go and hear it and then try to make it sound like that in here, you know. Yeah. What about with acoustic guitars? Do you apply the same principles? Yeah, totally. Um, very much so. And generally I'll listen, listen to an acoustic from many different angles, have the guy play and sort of move around and hear, hear it from different places and find the sweet spot with your ear, you know, where you really, where it's sounding the way you want to capture it. And then place your mics there, pretty much. Um, as far as miking techniques, I mean, well, there's many, as I'm sure you're well aware, you can do anything, really. And I think I've done a huge variety of stuff from uh, what are those little collar mics things, sticking them on the neck and God knows what. Uh, I worked with Lindsay Buckingham a few years ago for quite a long time, and which was an absolute treat in that he turned my whole concept of making records on its head uh, I thought I was pretty good at that point and knew my stuff and he basically turned everything upside down and we, we got a chance to experiment. It was actually a treat in that he would uh, he would say, well, how would you do this? And I would say, well, I'd do this. And he'd go, well, I'd do this. And, and, and I'd say, well, what do you want to do? He says, well, let's do it both ways. And this could involve like four days of work, <laughs> you know, which two days would be scrapped at the end of it. Didn't bother him at all. He said, well, you, you know what that means, Lindsay. Oh, that's all right. I, I don't mind. I, this is what I do. <laughs> so, so we got to play around a hell of a lot in a studio. So for me, that was probably the biggest learning experience for myself in that I got to try lots and lots of different things and some worked and some didn't, you mm. know. Anyway, back to acoustics. Yeah. We did a lot of acoustics as that's one of his specialities mm. and all sorts of miking techniques and putting mics in the back, in the front, inside, tying them onto the neck, and getting quirky sounds. Um, as a rule, though, I think, you know, you find the sweet spot in front of the hole, and uh, I, I think that at the moment I'm more inclined to use one mic because, you know, phasing and all of that, is, and uh, that's where I'm at at the moment, although I've got to say I've been around the block on this one a few times. <laughs> yeah. And when, as far as microphones, I, I love 251s. With an acoustic guitar, I generally like to use a tube mic. In general, I like to use tube mics where possible. I'm mm -hmm. a big fan, you know, 251s, 47s, C12s, you know, C12As. Do you point them pretty much straight out the, the sweet spot, or do you go at an angle? Or? Yeah, well, again, no hard and fast rules with me. I, I mean, what, what I will do is I'll nudge it around until I'm happy. I'll maybe start off straight and then maybe get the guy to turn around on it. Another technique I found that w really works well with a acoustic guitar is sort of cheating, is get the musician to put some headphones on and just tell him to move around until it, and we're both listening to it, mm. and it's pretty clear where, where it's sweet, you know? And, you know, some musicians say, well, I don't know where the sweet spot is, and I'll say, well, if you listen, you can probably figure it out, you know? Because there's no mystery to this game, mm. really. And uh, so, yeah. Um, get your acoustic player to just move a little bit to the left and right and um, it all comes into focus suddenly, all right, don't move, maybe paint a little spot on the floor where he's got to stay put, you know, mm. and stuff like that. That's the sort of techniques I will use for, for acoustic. There's a lot of kind of rock records coming out these days which have pretty strange sounding acoustic guitars and sort of really processed sort of sounds. Do you get into any of that kind of really... Yeah. Impressed and weird sounding ones. Yeah, yeah, occasionally, occasionally. Um, How do you do those? Well, the, I like to add a lot of rooms to, to acoustic sometimes. You can get some weird stuff by adding rooms and close mics and sort of blends of the two, loads of compression and stuff, just to get weird, weird things happening, mm. you know, so... You're talking about digital reverb with rooms, or...? Uh, no, room mics. Real I'm, rooms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, I'm talking about. So when you record it, you yeah, yeah. You so, so for example, you might have your close mic, say on the on the wherever you've found your little spot here, yeah. or your close mics. I, I said I'm using one. That's not strictly true. Very often I use two, you know. Um, and then maybe 
a selection of rune mics, a rune mic really far away, but maybe compressed so that it's, and then blended in with the original sound. So mm -hmm. you've got this uh, weird thing. Another thing, just for weird acoustic sounds, which I again learned with Lindsay, is uh, very speeding. He, you know, especially in the days of tape, we used to mm. do a lot of that. In fact, if you listen to a record like Rumors, and all of those guitars are a little sort of not quite right, you know, in terms of it doesn't quite sound like a guitar, but it's not quite like a, you know, lute or something. It's all VSO. I don't think there's a guitar recorded at real time in there. Sometimes recorded fast and slowed down. Sometimes recorded slow and sped up a little mm -hmm. bit. But all a little out of whack, and that gives them their sort of unique character. So a bit of that sometimes, mm. just to create some slightly different sounds, you know. And do you do you still record on tape, or do you do? It? Oh God, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, t the truth is, not a lot. No, I think having got in, into Pro Tools. It's kind of hard to go back, yeah. unfortunately. How do you very speed that then? Well, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with problems. I haven't actually done a very speed thing with acoustics, per se, since since using that. And, well, there are ways of changing your sample rates and stuff, but you're pretty limited in, you know, in, in doing that. So that is one of the, draw one of the drawbacks. Mm. And then again, the tape very speed's way cooler than it's got its unique thing. I don't know. I haven't haven't mm -hmm. crossed that. Well, probably in, in that instance would fly it out to to a machine, very speed it, fly it back, something yeah, like that. Yeah. You know, there's always a way around it. So, do you do you foresee a time when you might produce and use another engineer? Yeah. Well, I kind of uh, yeah have nudged on that at all. It's it's a funny it's a funny one that because the more I mean I'm not trying to blow my own trumpet, but as you get more experienced, you certainly know what you want and. It's very. It becomes pretty easy to do. I mean, the mystery of engineering is kind of long since gone for me, especially when I'm working on my own productions. You know, it's not like it's not a huge trauma that it was when I first started. Oh God, how am I going to get this sound? It's like, and you get it, you know. Yeah. And so to have another guy, it's like it's almost it's almost an impediment because you've got to sort of relay to him and explain to him, and he's got to get it. Then you've got to go, oh, well, not quite, you know. By which time you're going to done it, you know. And so. <laughs> At the same time, there are certain guys that I've worked with um, as assistants when I've been engineering um, who really know what I want. And I've worked with them a lot, you know, for months on end and many times. And I can think of about three guys that I'd be more than happy to, en to have engineering for me. And occasionally we've done little bits and bobs, yeah. Right. Because, you know, there's no, there's no sort of... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for, conflict at all. I mean, they just know, and I can go into the room and they've got it exactly the way I'd want it and they know they know what they're doing and I yeah. trust them. And so, yes, absolutely. Mm. I think when you're working, when you're totally in a production mode, it is kind of nice not to have to worry about all of that stuff. Yeah, you know, yeah. without a doubt. How, how do you go about coaxing good performances out of artists? Ah, uh, same thing. Make the, artist, make the musician your friend. Back to Al Schmidt, yeah? yeah. Uh, key. And so they trust you. Yeah. Make, first you have to earn their trust you have to, they have to hear a few good sounds coming out so yeah. they think wow this guy knows what he's doing and that's pretty you know that, that'll happen after a time because they're all so insecure anyway they're dying to latch on to something <laughs> <laughs> and so once you have their trust then you can really start to um, I hate to say manipulate them but manipulate is kind of the, is the word really um, you have to sort of steer them and I think you just have to be very open and, and tell them and it's a fine line between destroying someone's confidence and, uh, you know, getting what you want. I mean, you, I've seen certain producers, probably who sh should best remain nameless, uh, I mean, names that you would absolutely know in a drop of a hat and you would be surprised if I told you, I'll tell you later, <laughs> who this was. But intimidating artists to get a performance yeah. out of them. And perhaps with a certain type of person that might work, mm. you know. But for the most part, I think artists are fairly fragile people, mm. although they, you know, because we see them with their pants down and basically in that, in that moment, when they're on stage, they're full of confidence. But when they're in a recording studio s struggling to get their stuff on tape, um, you see them in a very, very vulnerable state. And um, so I, I, I think from my experience, it's much better to be gentle with them and you know encourage them with love rather than sort of fear you know yeah and I think both methods maybe work with certain people but as a rule um, you have to sort of 
boost them up, bolster them, and uh, once you've done that, you, you have to get them to sort of eat out of your hand, and then you can start to steer them. You know, mm. then you once they once they know they're in safe territory. A bit like seducing a woman, eh? <laughs> once they know they're safe, they can get away with murder, yeah? <laughs> Cut. What What do you think makes you good at what you do then? I think I've probably asked you it before. But um, boy. Well, again, that's assuming I'm good at what I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think a large key to me being good at what I do is I get along with people as a rule. Mm. I'm personable and probably the sort of ultimate people pleaser. I'm going out of my way to make people feel comfortable all the time. And I think a lot of the time I succeed. And so. I, I really think making good music is out of having good relationships with people and it's very much a people business. It's, uh, it's not a technical business at all as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's, um, it's just making people feel comfortable to emote their feelings, you know, and in an environment, creating an environment where they're not inhibited and they're prepared, prepared to spill their guts for you, you know. And that's really what I think it's about.